And good morning again. We'd like to welcome those that are now joining us in our live stream. Last week, as I shared with you, that we would uh, just have to have to be continued. And so today we will be continuing to look at what it means to be a child of God. And our scripture reading is from the same passage. It'll be Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse 14 through verse 16. And as we read, I would remind us it is the word of God inspired by the spirit of God and inviting the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts to make this come alive to us. And so let us listen, not only with our hearts, but in our spirit. We read, Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Let's pray. Lord, we come and we ask that your Holy Spirit will just take this time and take your word and speak to our hearts and to our lives. We ask that you will give us insight and understanding. Lord, I come and I acknowledge that I am utterly dependent upon you. I cannot teach this in the flesh. I desperately need you. I ask for the anointing power of your Holy Spirit. I ask for your cleansing that you would make me fit and clean for your use. And Lord, I ask that you speak to us and that you're glorified in our hearts here today. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, last week as we were looking into this passage, Paul introduced us to this amazing reality that when you come to know Jesus Christ personally, that is, you know Jesus Christ first as your Savior. You've come to understand, I am a sinner and I can't do anything about it and I need a Savior and I believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay my sin debt, that he was buried and that he rose again. And then I come to the understanding that my life got all messed up because I was the one governing it anyway. And so now I want to surrender that control of my life up to Jesus Christ where he governs over my life as my Lord. And so when I come to know Jesus personally as my Lord and my Savior, I become a child of God. Contrary to popular opinion, you were not born physically as a child of God. The Bible says in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. And so it's only those who have come to know Jesus Christ personally. That means the truth is, if you've never made that commitment to Jesus Christ in your life, then you are not a child of God. But you need to understand this. It is true, though, that God created you. God loves you. God wants you as his child. He invites you to be his child. And he will not force you to do so. He leaves that entirely up to you. And if you want to be a child of God, then all you have to do is believe in Jesus and what we just said, that he died for you, paid your sin debt, and surrender your life to him. And the moment you do that, you become a new child, a child of God. And you have a new identity. And that identity is now, I am a child of God. Now that is so basic, and yet it is something that it seems like we can so easily forget. I know I've shared this with you before, but you know, I enjoy football, especially watching the Colts play. And you probably have seen this happen as well. But let's say that they've uh, been in a game and they didn't do very well. That's happened a lot. And let's say they didn't handle the ball well. They had several turnovers in the game. They had interceptions. And, you know, they just did not play well. And then they're interviewing the coach, and it really doesn't matter which one it was or is. And then the coach says in the interview, well, this week we're just going to get back and we're going to focus on basics. Now, the first time I heard a coach say that, I thought, these are professional football players. They don't know the basics of the game. Now, sometimes they look like they don't. 
And then I began to realize, you know, we all need to be reminded at times of the basics. And the one basic that you need to remember more than anything else is that I am a child of God. See, no matter what's going on in your life, regardless of what it is, in spite of our failures, we need to remember I am a child of God. And the more that we lay hold of that truth, the more victorious we will be. When you're struggling, if you're struggling with temptation or doubt or fear, remember who you are. As we read, I'm not a slave. I'm no longer a slave. I'm no longer a slave of fear. I'm no longer a slave of sin because I am a child of God. Because I'm a child of God, he lives in me. He is enabling me. He is empowering me so that I can be victorious. Even though I'm weak and even when I fail, I am not defeated because I am a child of God. And so last week we looked at what happened when you became a child of God. And in verse 15, reading it from the New American Standard, it says, For you have not received a spirit of slavery, leading again to fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons and daughters, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. You see, the very moment that you come to know Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit come to live inside of you. And when the Holy Spirit did that, you were adopted into the family of God. By nature, we were born into Adam's family. That is, that we were born as sinners. That is what we are by nature and all of the problems that went along with that. And God takes us out of our old sinful family and adopts us into his family. And we saw last week that when you were adopted... You have been chosen. God has chosen you to be his child. Now, here's the beauty of it. He's invited everyone. And then he gives us the option to say, yeah, I want to be adopted into your family or not. But God loves you and he's chosen you. And as Paul's writing this letter, we need to remember he's writing to the Romans and he fully expects them to understand this concept of adoption from a Roman perspective from their cultural perspective and in Rome you could adopt but you could never disown an adopted child you could disinherit a natural descendant but if you adopted that child was yours and they were yours forever with that and so the fact that we have been adopted means that we have been chosen and that we are secure as children of God once you've been adopted into the family, you are in the family of God. And being a child of God means that there is a special relationship with God. He loves you. He loves you as a father loves his child. He provides for you as a loving father. He has plans for you, as Jeremiah would say, not to harm you, but to prosper you. He wants to hear you. He wants you to talk with him. He claims you. And because you are his child, he also corrects you. And he honors you. And when you became a child of God, he set you free. He set you free from the bondage of sin. He set you free from the bondage of fear. And yet, being human means that there will be times when doubt will creep in. And we begin to question, how can I know I am a child of God? And I want you to listen to me here. God wants you to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are his child. Sometimes when I'm talking to people, I may ask the question, have you come to the place in your life 
where you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if you were to die today, that you would spend eternity in the kingdom of God. And sometimes people tell me, yes, I have. Other times they say, I hope so. Not hope in the biblical sense of confident anticipation, but hope in the sense of buying a lottery ticket. I'm just not sure what's going to happen. They think that you have to wait till you die to know, and that is not what God wants. God wants you to know you have eternal life. God wants you to know that you are his child. As John writes in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you might know that you have eternal life, that you might know. No, this is something that God has dear upon his heart for you and your good to come to the understanding, I am a child of God. And so Paul continues and he gives us three levels of assurance as to how the Holy Spirit is working in our lives to give us the assurance that we are children of God. And so the very first thing that he says is in verse 13, and he says, if we are led by the Spirit, we are children of God. Now, for those of you, and especially anyone who has just recently come to know Jesus Christ, you may be asking, what does it mean to be led by the Spirit? That's a really good question. What does it mean? What does it look like? Well, to be led by the Spirit means that we're under His control. Remember when we talked about coming to know Jesus, that we are surrendering to Him because when we were leading our own lives, we didn't do such a great job. That's why we needed to have a Savior in that. And so we surrender to Him. Was the Holy Spirit who comes in and does the leading in our lives. It's surrendering that control of our life to Him. Now, while it's not identical with this, I think an example that you find in the scriptures is with Jesus when he was baptized. You might remember the story. Jesus goes out into the wilderness. He goes up next to the Jordan River where John is baptizing to be baptized. And when Jesus comes up out of the water, the heavens open up. The Holy Spirit descends upon him in the form of a dove. And a voice comes from heaven where the Father speaks. And he says, this is my son whom I love with him. I am well pleased. And then, and I love the way John Mark states this, he says, immediately the Spirit led him into the wilderness where he would be tempted for 40 days. Now, when you read that in the original language, it is an urgency that's in that, which Mark presents, but it's to be compelled by the Spirit. You see, this is when the Holy Spirit is working in your life. You can't really deny that something is going on here. And one of the easy ways to begin answering that question is simply ask, answering this one. Who is in control of my life? Am I still the one that's in control? Or am I truly giving that control up to Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit who lives inside of me? Now, there are several indicators of the Holy Spirit leading in our life that we find in the Bible. And while some of these may be present, it may be that all of them aren't. They all need to be. But right now we're just answering the question, how can I know that the Holy Spirit is leading me in my life? And I think the primary way that this happens, and this one is so important, this one is back to a basics kind of thing, it is the Holy Spirit who makes the Word of God come alive. It's the Holy Spirit who actually speaks to us and teaches us from God's Word. And no person can do that. Let me share with you a personal experience with this. So I know that one of the gifts that I have is pastor-teacher, and I know I'm more of a teacher. And so there'll be times that I've had people come and they'll say to me something either after a service or sometime during the week or maybe even later than that. And they'll say, you know, when you said such and such, it just spoke to me in such a special way. And then they'll say what it was that they experienced through that. And I'm listening. And when I was young and stupid and they would tell me what I said, I'm thinking, I didn't say that. I'm thrilled that God is speaking to them, but they've gotten me confused with somebody else. 
Now that I am old and stupid, I have gained a little bit of insight, and I have come to understand it was somebody else. It was the Holy Spirit. See, I actually believe that this can happen. I can be up here and I can be talking, and you can be listening, and you're going to hear what the Holy Spirit lays upon your heart. And you may hear it differently than the way that I said it. Because that's what you're needing to hear, and it's the way that you are needing to hear it. I think it's a lot like on the day of Pentecost. You read there that after the Holy Spirit came upon, the disciples went out, and they were proclaiming Jesus in the city. And you had people from all over the known world speaking different languages, and yet each one of them heard them in their own language. And I think that's how the Holy Spirit works. And so what's going on, if you think I'm teaching you something, it's really the Holy Spirit is doing it. And he's doing it in a language for you that you can understand. One that is relevant for you. See, it's the Holy Spirit who guides us in truth. Jesus even said that when the Holy Spirit comes, he will guide you in all truth. Let me ask you if you've ever experienced this. You've been reading the Bible... And as you're reading it, suddenly one of the passages, like it just leaps up off of the page at you. And now you have, you're just sitting there and you're thinking on this passage and it is saying something really deep to you. It wasn't because you were a genius that happened. It was the Holy Spirit making the word of God come alive. Or maybe you've experienced this. Now, I've read the Bible through many times. I don't say that to boast. I think everybody needs to be reading the Bible. And when you get old, you ought to read it through a lot of times. But I'll be reading a passage, and it's like, I didn't even know that was there. It's like, I have read that and read it and read it, and suddenly I'm reading, and there it is. Now, the reason that happens is because that is when the Holy Spirit knew I needed to hear it, and he made that verse come alive in a way that it never had before. See, it's the Holy Spirit who takes the Word of God and applies it to our life. And this is where a lot of people who profess to be followers of Jesus Christ really mess up. If you're not reading it, How's he going to make it alive to you? Have I ever told you that reading the Bible is the greatest catalyst for spiritual growth? You may be sick of that, but it's the truth. There is nothing greater. This is primarily how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. And if you're wanting God's Spirit to work in your life, you've got to get into the Word of God. And going to church once a week or every now and then is not going to do it. It just doesn't cut it. Now, not only does the Holy Spirit make the Word of God come alive in our life, and when He does that, we know He's leading the Holy Spirit also compels us to pray. I mean, have you ever had a time when you said, man, I just got to get away and pray. I need to spend some real time in prayer here. Or maybe you've experienced this. There's somebody that just comes to your mind and you feel this urge within you that you really need to be praying for them. And so you're going to pray for them, and it's like, Lord, I I'm lifting them up right now. I, I really don't even know what they need. I, I don't know exactly why I'm praying for them, Lord, but I'm wanting to lift them up before you. You know what's going on. And here's the beautiful thing about that. The Bible tells us that when we pray and we don't know what to pray for, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us in that. He's just telling you, you need to pray. I'll take care of the rest. And so we just lift them up to him. And so he compels us to go to the Lord in prayer, lifting these people up. Or it may be that you haven't prayed for a while. And suddenly there's something that's saying that. You haven't talked to God for a while. You really need to do this. And so the Holy Spirit makes God's word come alive. The Holy Spirit compels us to pray. And the Holy Spirit awakens a love for other disciples of Jesus. Have you ever met someone and the moment that you found out that they were a disciple of Jesus, you felt like you had a special bond with them? 
I mean, you felt like you were really family like you had just met your long lost brother or sister. Well, in the family of God, that's what they are. It really is like a family reunion. Well, I just found out another brother or sister I have in Jesus Christ here. This is awesome. I got to tell you a couple of experiences that we've had with this one. One of them, and I'm sharing these because these were really more unusual. We've experienced this at other times too. But these were kind of unusual with this. So this was right after everything had been shut down from the pandemic and we were starting to get back to some semblance of normalcy. And so Vicki and I planned a vacation. We wanted to go back to the Black Hills. We love the Black Hills of South Dakota. This is a free advertisement for them. If you've never been there, you need to go. If you've been, you probably ought to go back. Now, this isn't the best time of year to go. But we can talk about that later. But anyway, we will decide we go to the Black Hills. And when we go, one of the conversations we will often have is, well, do we want to go by Mount Rushmore? Because we've been to Mount Rushmore more times than I can count. And it's like, oh, we've seen it before. It still looks the same as it looked before. But we get there, and inevitably, there is something that draws us to it. It's like, I cannot go into the Black Hills without going to Mount Rushmore. And so we'll always go up there, and then when we go in, we have a favorite trail there. I, I think they call it the Trail of the Presidents. I don't know exactly, but it goes right underneath the monument, and it circles around. It's a great trail. If you ever go, you need to do that trail. And when we go there, I've taken so many pictures on that trail. I don't need another picture of Mount Rushmore, but there's something inside that says you've got to take a picture. And there's a couple of areas there that I just know, this is really the place I want to get a picture. I guess I'm trying to get something better than I've done before. I don't know what it is. And I'll start taking some pictures. And there's one place in particular, and it's pretty early on the trail, and we come there. And so I'm taking my time there, and I'm taking some several pictures, you know, just trying to get it just right with this and line everything up and frame it like I wanted. And so Vicki's seen this so many times, she just kept on walking. And on this particular occasion, after I got my pictures, I walked up, and there had been a, two couples that were walking together that the Lord had just directed her attention towards. And so she actually went up to start talking to them, and I come up and about the time they begin talking. And so now there's the, the six of us that are standing there. And it doesn't take long till we find out these are people who know Jesus. And we start talking about our faith with them. They're sharing things that are going on with them. We're sharing things that were going on with us and how our faith that came into play during COVID and all the garbage that went on with all of that stuff. And so we are really connecting with each another on a really deep level with this. And imagine this. Here we are on this trail right underneath the monument. I mean, George is right up there looking down at us. And the six of us gather over in a corner on that trail and have a prayer meeting. We're just lifting each other up before Jesus. See, we felt compelled to pray. We talked about that one. But here we have met new family. These are people that we will know forever in the kingdom of God. I may not see them again until we get into the kingdom of God. But I know that's two brothers and sisters more than I have in the kingdom. They feel like real family. I mean, have you ever experienced this year with real family? And the more you're with real family, you can't wait to get with your real family in the family of God. It's like, boy, I've had enough of this family. I want to be with people who know Jesus. Yeah, that's, that's what he's talking about. He gives us this real love that we have for other believers in Jesus Christ. It's where you just can't wait to be with them. Now, you may have experienced this. Now, I really don't get it, but some people quit church. I, I've got to be honest. I just don't get that one. I hear the things that people say, and I just think they're all a bunch of smoke screens with it. I don't get it. I mean, if you love the family, you want to be with the family. And the story I want to share with you, the lady's name is Nan. I was Nan's pastor a long time ago. And what I said to Nan, I wouldn't say this to a lot of people, and I really believe the Holy Spirit led me to say it, but Nan had come in to see me, and Nan was upset. And Nan just laid it all out. I mean, she just let everything that was frustrating her come flooding out at me and that. And she went on with it all, and finally she finished with all of it. And when she finished, she says, I just ought to quit. And so I looked at her, and I said, well, why don't you? And she looks stunned, and then she looks straight at me, and she says, you know 
I can't. When the Spirit of God is leading you, you can't just quit. This is family. This is the family of God. We are believers who share a life together. And when we're being led by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will make the world empty and God real. Maybe you've been walking with the Lord and you've begun drifting away a little bit and you're looking for fulfillment. And so you go back to some of the things you experienced when you were living in the world and you're looking for fulfillment in that and you find out it doesn't do anything but leave you empty. See, that's what the Holy Spirit does. There is no way. It's, it was always empty. You just didn't realize that before you come to know Jesus Christ. And now that you are in him and you go back to this same old stuff and it does nothing for you. And the only thing that fills you is your relationship with your heavenly father in that. Another indication of being led by the spirit is that you see the fruit of the spirit being produced in your life. In Galatians chapter five, Paul talks about the fruit of the spirit. And here's what he says. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, you could spend the whole sermon just talking about what each one of those are, so we don't have time for that. But let's just look at this as a group. Now, with this being produced in our life, this does not mean that you're going to see all of the fruit all of the time and that it is going to be an abundant harvest. That is the goal. But as you are growing in Christ, you need to be asking the question then, am I seeing more fruit? Is the work of the Spirit in my life more fruitful today than what it was, say, a year ago with that? Or in my lifetime, am I more loving? Is love being produced in my life? Is patience being produced in my life? And is gentleness or self-control there? I mean, you can go through the whole list. Or am I really growing in these? And if I look at my life and I say, you know, really I can't, I can see where more fruit is being produced in my life. That is an indication then that I am being led by the Spirit. And as I mentioned earlier, the Holy Spirit also gives us gifts. They're called the gifts of the Spirit. There are so many of them, I can't even read them all right now. I mean, God is creative. Now, here's the thing about the gifts of the Spirit. They're not to be confused with natural gifts and abilities. We're all born with natural gifts and abilities, things that you do that just come to you naturally. But when you come to know Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit comes in, he brings gifts of the Spirit with him as well. Now, it doesn't mean you're always going to be aware of what all of them are instantly. And if you're not looking for the gifts, you may not even discover them in that. And some people do that. They're just not really looking to see how God has gifted them. Or they're still listening to these lies that limit what God can do in their life with it. But the Holy Spirit brings these gifts. Now listen, these are supernatural gifts. Now don't go there that this is something like Superman where you leap over a building in a single bound. That's fiction. These are the gifts of the Spirit. What makes them supernatural is that this was not a part of who you were before you come to know Jesus Christ. Now, that does not mean that your natural gift does not align with your spiritual gift. After all, it's the same God. So why wouldn't some of our spiritual gifts actually align with what our uh, natural gifts are, natural talents in life? But these supernatural gifts like... Natural gift. Let's take an example here. So let's say that the, one of the natural gifts that some people have in life is they are actually musical and they can learn to play the piano and do it well. I did not get that one. In fact, I can't even sing well. And so if I started singing really good and started playing a piano, you know there's something supernatural going on. That's probably not going to happen because that's not a natural talent and it's not a spiritual gift either. But there are people that have that natural talent and God uses it in a mighty way in people's lives to bring others into a place of worship with that. And that is a spiritual gift when we do that. For me, one of the spiritual gifts that God gave me, and I mentioned this earlier, is that of pastor teacher. And it is a gift that comes from God. Now, Here's what I want you to know this. Sometimes, and I think that this is really true for everyone, 
You're going to have at least a spiritual gift that in order to use it is going to take you out of your comfort zone. Now, why would God do that? Why does he want you out of your comfort zone? Because if this is something that comes natural to you, are you going to depend upon him or are you going to depend upon yourself? See, I'm an introvert. I don't talk in front of people. I don't like to talk in front of people. But when God called me to do this, you know, you do this in front of people. And so I can't do it, but he does. Anytime I stand up here, I know that it's the Holy Spirit. Got to tell you a little story here. So I had a great mentor that God had sent into my life when I was being called into a ministry with that. And so he came to me one day and he says, you know, Glenn, if God's calling you into ministry, you're going to have to preach sometime. Now, how do you argue with wisdom like that? And so I found myself saying something I know was the Holy Spirit because I said, yeah, yeah. He says, I got a date I want you to preach on this day. He gave me time to prepare. He gave me plenty of time to prepare on that because I've never done this before. I don't know how you prepare to preach. And so I, I, I'm doing this, and I go, and I, what am I going to preach on? So I start reading the Bible, and God tells me, here's what I want you to preach on through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I began preparing on that, learning all kinds of things about it. And then it comes time for the service that evening. This was in an uh, uh, evening service at a church, and I'm sitting there on the front pew. I'm not even nervous, and I thought, something's wrong. I'm going to be talking in front of people, and I'm not even nervous. And then it was time for me to get up. And I looked, and it was just like here. There were two steps coming up to that pulpit area. And I thought as I stood up, I am going to trip on that step and fall flat on my face right here in front of everybody. Didn't happen, by the way. And here's what I found. I got behind the pulpit in that church. And the moment I opened my mouth, I felt the power of the Holy Spirit in a way I never felt it before in my entire life up to that point. This is where God took me out of my comfort zone with a supernatural gift. Well, I'm going to tell you, when I'm standing here, this is not natural. And so it is something supernatural in that. You see, that's how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. And so he gives us for ministry. And sometimes the things that he's calling us to do are things that take us out of our comfort zone with that as well. And when we see the Holy Spirit working in our lives, it gives us the assurance we are children of God. Now, the second level of assurance that Paul mentions is actually where we have an emotional response to the fatherhood of God. He says in verse 15, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. This is where we have those moments where we are keenly aware that he is our father. Now, here's what we have to understand. The word Abba is Aramaic. And you can translate it father, but it's really more endearing than most people use the term father. It's just like my kids. My kids, I don't think my oldest daughters ever call me father. And the only time Sarah calls me father is when she's disgusted with me. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm daddy. And daddy is a term of endearment. That's how the word Abba is used here. It is talking about that kind of special relationship. It is a child's emotional response to its father. It is an awareness of a deep personal intimacy in a relationship. It's knowing my father loves me. He's concerned about me. He is protecting me. You know, I, I, for most things, I'm not really a very emotional person. And talking about an emotional response, you don't get a whole lot of those from Glenn. But there are times, and I, I've experienced this. Vicki has seen this happen, probably one of the few that has, where I am so overcome emotionally with what God is doing that I can't really 
there'll be times we'll be sitting at the house and she'll look over and she'll see a tear coming down my eye or something and she'll say, what's going on? And I can't even tell her she loves that. Yeah, I, I gotta confess, you know, that, that's just not, I, I think she's sadistic when she loves it, but no, she just loves seeing that happen in all honesty. But it is, it's where we have that response. And I'm not saying that you have to cry. We, we all do things differently on an emotional level. But it means I am really coming to this understanding that he is my father. Or it may be where I'm suddenly and unexpectedly aware that I belong to God. It's when the soul cries out, Abba, Father. Now, the third level of assurance that he gives us is a deep conviction. He says in verse 16, the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. It's where we have this awareness that comes over us that says, I belong to him. He is my father. I can't deny him and he won't deny me. Maybe you've experienced something like this. Maybe you've had a time in your life where you actually began moving away from God in your relationship with him. You, you did things that you probably even were ashamed of. And yet even during that time, you come to understand, I cannot escape from God being my father. Reminds me of the story of Jonah. You remember Jonah. God tells Jonah, I want you to go up to Nineveh preach. And so Jonah goes down and gets on a boat you knew there was a problem immediately. He's either directionally challenged or he's running away. Nineveh's in the desert, so you don't get there via boat. And so Jonah's going to run away from God. He doesn't want to do what God's called him to do. He gets on the boat, he's running. He gets out at sea and he finds out you can't run away from God out here. I get out to sea and he's still out here. And so they throw him overboard on the boat. He ends up in the belly of a fish. And even in the belly of a fish, Jonah says... I descended into the deeps and you were there. You can't get away from it. I am God's child. He's not going to let you get away from the reality. You are my child. And so the Holy Spirit speaks to our spirit, giving us this deep conviction that I belong to God. I am a child of God. Now, even with the assurances that the Holy Spirit gives us, it does not mean that the devil is not going to try and convince you that you're not worthy to be a child of God. He will. Now, why does he want to do that? Let's address that. He does so because if he can convince you that you're not worthy, he neutralizes you in the kingdom of God. He knows all i got to do is get you to where you're feeling that you're totally unworthy and you're not going to do much of anything in the kingdom of God and so I have neutralized you. You're no longer a threat to me. This is one area that he wants to attack over and over in our life. That's why it's a basic truth that we have to keep reminding ourselves of because the devil's going to do everything he can to tell you you're not worthy to be a child of God. So let's address this. First of all, you aren't worthy. That's the reason Jesus died on the cross. But when you come to know Jesus Christ, his blood covers your sin, his righteousness covers you, and he is worthy. And so now in Jesus Christ, you are worthy to be a child of God because you're clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. So you didn't have anything to do with it anyway. And so when you mess up, you don't have anything to do with messing it up. You're a child of God. So what we need to understand is this concept of being worthy is a mute point. It means nothing. All of the worthiness comes through Jesus Christ. And in him, God has adopted me into his family. He has made me clean. He has made me pure. And when God sees me, he sees the righteousness of Jesus. And there's not anything more than that that he could ever see. But yet Satan's going to come along, try to convince you that you're not worthy to be a child of God. And this is where we have to constantly remind ourselves 
I am a child of God. I mean, we need to be saying that a lot. It needs to be said every day. It needs to be said several times a day. When you are struggling in your life, whatever it is you're struggling with, remind yourself of the basics. I am a child of God. That is the key to victory. Let's pray together. Lord, we come and we thank you for your word. We ask, Lord, that we will truly understand that we are your children that we will have that assurance that comes into our lives, Lord, that we will be set free from those doubts. And Lord, that certainly sets us free from fear when we know that we are your child. As your child, there is nothing to fear. And so, Lord, we give ourselves up before you right now, asking you to work as you see fit. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite us all. Oh, no, we're not going to sing yet. Have we passed out communion? Okay, I'll just do it this way. Does anyone need a communion service? You got your little packet. Okay. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he went to the upper room with his disciples and he had anticipated and planned on sharing that Passover with his disciples. And it was that night during the meal that Jesus took the bread and he said, this bread is my body. And then he blessed it. Oh Lord, we thank you for the bread that came down out of heaven. Not as our fathers ate and died in the wilderness, but that whoever eats this bread lives forever. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Amen. And then he broke it just as his body would be broken shortly after that. After that, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And he blessed it. Oh Lord, you teach us in your word that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And yet it also says it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away our sins. We thank you for Jesus Christ, the one that John identified as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Lord, we thank you for his blood that was poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. Amen. It was then that Jesus invited his disciples to partake. If you have your communion cups right now, you'll peel back the cellophane layer and that will reveal your bread. The body of Christ broken for you. Now, if you would peel back the foil, and you'll probably want to be careful as you do that. The blood of Christ shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Now I want to invite us all to stand for our closing song. Clan. 